the Middle East was in great turmoil again, where the two superpowers of that time, Assyria and uh, Egypt, were contesting and rubbing against each other like superpowers do still today. Israel, as usual, was the little country in the middle of all of this, and they were facing total destruction. And God raised up a prophet to speak into the nation to advise them as to what was happening and why it was happening. And in spite of the fact that Habakkuk's message was, you are going to be totally annihilated because of your disobedience to God, in the middle of that black message, there was a great hope. And it's found in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 14, where God says, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Observers of what happened back then, like any natural disaster, would outline the wars which took place and what happened to Israel and how they were carried off into captivity, etc., but the one thing that observers or reporters or diplomats can never convey is what is God doing on the broader scene through these things. And it is still exactly the same today. We have to go to the Bible to get an understanding of the principles and the activities, the way in which God works in our world. The country of Egypt has been in the news now for a number of years. But what you don't know is what happens behind the scenes. It was about four years ago when a prayer team, mostly from the city of Brisbane, was operating in the nation of Tunisia, where God revealed to them that he was about to do completely new things right along North Africa and sweeping around into the Middle East where all those wars are going on at the moment. It was in January 2011 that churches in Alexandria up on the, the Mediterranean Sea and then down in Cairo, each without reference to the other, felt a strange burden to pray for their nation. The one in Alexandria prayed for 25 days. The one in, in uh, Cairo prayed and fasted for 40 days. And at the end of that time, both of them felt the burden shifted. And so they ceased to pray. It was the next morning when the crowds started to gather in Tahir Square in the center of Cairo and a revolution was underway. And right through that area, powerful dictators who had been in power for decades unexpectedly were overthrown. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 23, that God brings princes to naught and reduces the rulers of this world to nothing. To which in Job chapter 20 verse 23 it adds, God makes nations great and destroys them. He enlarges nations and he dispels them. The nation of Egypt has been in the news of course for millennia. This was the country to which Abraham and Jacob and Joseph and Joseph and Mary and Jesus all went. The Bible has a lot to say about Egypt both then and in its future positioning. The gospel came to Egypt through the Apostle Mark and a strong church was established. But then in the 7th century, the Arab Islam invasion came not just to Egypt, but right across northern Africa. It was in the 10th century when the Caliph, that is the Islamic leader of the day, was hosting a debate and the debate before him was amongst Christians and Jews, and he liked to get them stirring the aggro, getting them fighting with one another. And the Jewish debater said, your Bible says in Matthew 17, 20, that if you have faith as small as a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. But you Christians don't really believe your own Bible. That was the Jewish commentator's or, or, or debater's barb. The caliph immediate, immediately interjected and said to the Christians, well, that's a good challenge. I want you to prove he is wrong. I have a mountain on the edge of what was then that year's Cairo, 
and I would like to establish a market there. The mountain is called Mount Mokotom. I want you to pray and to see the mountain removed as your Bible says you may pray in Matthew 17, 20. Prove him wrong. And as usual, you have the normal choices before you. And these choices still apply today in any nation in which Islam takes over. Number one, you can be exiled from the country. Number two, you can become Muslims. Number three, you can choose to remain as a Christian and then be taxed into penury, poverty and oblivion. Or you may choose, number four, to be die by the sword. But on this occasion, I give you a fifth option. And that option is pray and see the mountain moved. So, you Christians, what option would you like to choose? Well, I wonder what we would have chosen on that day. The Christian leaders decided in favor of the prayer option. And uh, then they had to decide, well, who will pray for us? Uh, the leaders, the official leaders, wisely thought that they, well, when it came to the reality of spiritual matters, they weren't that good. They were just good at their own titles and their own organization and so forth. But they did know of one man in their midst who was an extremely serious Christian. He was a tanner, a lowly level worker. His name was Simon. And Simon was such a sincere Christian, he literally implemented everything that he could as he found in the scripture. So when fitting a shoe to a woman's leg and improper thoughts took him, he then, understanding what Jesus said, went and gouged out his eye with one of his instruments. Before dawn every morning, he was out carrying water to the sick and the infirm. He did it before dawn so that no one would see him. But he understood Jesus had said something to say about those sort of things. That's the sort of man he was. Simon agreed to pray on the day if he could stand in the midst of the Christians anonymously and that no one would know he was the selected person. On the day, they all gathered and the Muslims gathered around to see what would happen. The Christians started to go through their formulaic methods of, adopt, of addressing God. And at the appointed time, Simon lifted his hands and he prayed in Jesus' name at the end of his prayer, Amen. And immediately an earthquake shook the mountain. The Muslims became so frightened that they asked the Christians to stop praying. The caliph was so overwhelmed that he gave the Christians the opportunity to receive anything they wanted. And they said, we don't want gold or money or any of those things. Just give us permission to repair our little church out here, which, of course, you can't get normally in a Muslim country to do any repairs. But he, they gave permission, and so he started, they started to repair the church. God recycles history. Nothing is wasted. Come forward a thousand years from those events. And we find that the president of the day, Jamal Abdul Nasser, was still thwarting in 1968 under the humiliation which had been poured out upon his nation by the Israeli forces in the Arab-Israeli War of 1967. It is normal for Muslims to look around to blame someone else. They want to position themselves always as victims. And so he chose that the reason for the loss of war must be those Christians in the nation. And so he said, of all the garbage collectors, because Christians will have the lowest jobs in society in Muslim countries, he said, all of you people must move out of Cairo and you will live on the rubbish dump, that stinking, vile place where you put the garbage every day. So 5,000 of them left the city and lived midst the garbage which they dumped there every day with their little donkey-drawn carts. Some years later, a young Bible college student was passing by and commented to the local people who were living a bestial existence, their brains fogged by alcohol and the only way they could find to, to, to live in the midst of such filth and stench. And he said to them, why are you Christians living like this, your immoral lives? You shouldn't be doing that. And they said to him, well, people say we're Christians. We don't know what that means. We want to challenge you. You come and live amongst us and show us and tell us what a Christian is to be like. 
Father Saman still lives there today as an old man. He's somewhat unwell and he's there with his family. Today there are 500,000 Christians who live in that area. And Father Saman was able to help them, not just teaching them what a Christian is to be and how they're to live, but he taught them how they could recycle the metal and the plastic, the glass, the paper, even the food scraps with animals living on the roof, processing, recycling all the food garbage that they bought in. And so they managed over time to build their own schools and dispensaries, hospitals, everything which a community needs to function. But one thing they lacked, a church. There's no way the government would give permission to build a church. But then back in the 70s, as a number of fellows were scrabbling around the face of the mountain, Mount Mokotom, they came to what seemed to be a little hole and they, they came to the, the father and they said, Father, what, what, what can we do here? And he prayed about it and after a while they said, well, let's excavate and see what happens. From that hole on their heads in little baskets, they ended up carrying out 200,000 tons of rock and they found this huge cave in there. And when they got down to the bottom, to the floor of the cave, there was the remains of the ancient church nearby, a grave of someone whom they believe is Saint Simon, Simon the Tanner, after a thousand years. In that place, and along with other auditoria they've made in the, gra in the caves, every Thursday night, 10 thousand believers gather for the midweek Bible study and prayer led by their pastor. But when Christians come together, they don't just come together to inform the mind. They come together to be impacted by a visitation of the Spirit. And so the priest there, he always says, well, anyone in need of prayer, come forward and we'll pray for you. And he stays with his team praying there till 11, 12, 1, 2, 3, however long it takes till everyone is prayed for. When I was there, I noticed along one side a massive shed which went on for 100 meters or so. And I said to the folk, what, what's, what's that there for? Oh, come and we'll show you. And they opened the door and I looked inside and it was full of wheelchairs and crutches and all of that paraphernalia. I noticed that here we have some chairs for the disabled or those with back problems. They'd probably, we'd throw those in there as well because they said to me, these things are here because as we pray for people, when God touches them, they don't need this stuff anymore. So we throw it in there. Hallelujah. Don't know if the school will allow us to throw out those special chairs up there. <laughs> God is at work in Egypt. There are more things that I could say, but uh, this is being recorded. I think I've probably said all that I should say at this time. But God is at work in Egypt in amazing ways. Over in India, there is the largest slums in the world in Mumbai. Massive, where millions of people live. And for 14 years, Shivama and her husband had lived in those slums. Big water pipes. They live inside the water pipes. For three years, she and her husband had tried to have a child and couldn't until one day a pastor came by and offered to pray and she conceived and had a child. They wanted to have a second one. When the pastor came again, he prayed and a second one. A very valuable pastoral ministry here. <laughs> But then the little one got sick and nothing could save her. But the pastor came again and prayed and the child was cured. The pastor had been coming into the slums there for three years and he did a couple of things. He never led by hammering them with John 3.16 or anything like that, which they wouldn't have understood. He quietly came in and started to help the community, sitting with the children under a tree, teaching them to read and write. And then he did some work with the adults, showing them how they could save a little bit of money and form a savings cooperative, we call this microeconomic development, and how they could gradually improve their situation. And so the community started to prosper. But as Shivama says, before this pastor came, 
Every day we used to drink alcohol and fight. But eventually I realized through the prayer of the pastor that Jesus is actually alive. And I came to know and to trust him. And he has brought peace to our family. There was a pastor who walked the talk. It's not just the preaching of words. It's words and works which go together. People are not souls without bodies, nor are they bodies without souls. We have to hold those two things in tension. And God will use our compassion to bring people to himself as people are impacted by that. The city of Agra is where the famous Taj Mahal is. Four single girls went into that city. And there they found a priest in a Hindu temple who was very sick. No one could cure him. Everyone had tried. They offered to pray for him. As they prayed, he was healed. He was so impacted by that, he said to his other priests, and he was the chief priest of the temple, about what had happened to him, what Jesus had done. And after they discussed this, they offered their temple to the girls to run as their church. That's not a bad way to get a church building for yourself. (laughs) Varanasi is for Hindus what Mecca is for Muslims. Every Hindu would hope to go to the city of Varanasi on the edge of the Ganges River, there to die, have their bodies cremated and their ashes thrown in to the mother river of the Ganges and eventually out into the Bay of Bengal. It is a very dark place. The funeral pyres burn 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It is dark. And yet a young 24-year-old follower of Jesus went into that place. And as it was in Agra, finding someone who was incurably ill because people go there to die, he prayed and the person was healed. Within two years, through the ministry of this young man, 12 new churches came into being in the city of Agra. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 14, Jesus says, Let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and give praise to your Father in heaven. Christianity came to India through the Apostle Thomas. It flourished down in the south. But up in the north, the 19 northern provinces with over 300 Aryan Hindus living there, that's always been the graveyard of Christianity and missions. Nothing much has ever been able to penetrate those high caste Brahmin and other caste areas. But in the last few decades, that has changed. In 2001... Christians were just 2% of the population. It's thought that now already they might be 6%. As new churches are being birthed all through those northern regions in new movements. One movement which started about 20 years ago when I was talking to their leader a year or so ago, he said they had a goal that year of seeing 50,000 new converts being baptized. And I said to him, well, 50,000, that's pretty good. Uh, what if you don't achieve that goal? He said, if we do not achieve this, we will know that our churches are backsliding. I thought, what does that say about church in my country? So the next year when I met with him, I said, how did it go? <laughs> he said, we got 55,000 new converts baptized. I said, what, what's the secret about this? How do you do this? He summed it up in three words. The secret is intimacy with Jesus. John 15, 5, Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. nothing. We understand that up here, but do we practice it down here? Without me, you can do nothing. Another movement with whom I work, they have a goal of establishing 100,000 new churches by the year 2030, and they're well on the way to achieving that. But of course, there's been a change in India. Prime Minister Modi, whom the world is coming to admire, has made a difference. But remember this, he comes from an extreme Hindu movement. 
and with his coming, persecution has broken out as never before. In the first six months of his prime ministership, there were over 600 violent attacks on Christianity. All sorts of things are, are happening now in India. In one instance, in one of the states where 104 newer Christians were captured by radical Hindus. Six of them were immediately clubbed to death with large rocks on hammers that they use when they slaughter goats for sacrifice. The other 98 were given an option. Return to Hinduism or what we've done to these six, we will do to you. Every one of those 98 newer Christians opted to follow Jesus, and they were killed, every one of them. These are the sort of things that are not reported very much back here. But amazing things are happening in India. But India travels about 15 years behind what happens in China. Shortly after communism conquered China, in the early 1950s, a census revealed that there were just 660,000 Christians in that nation as a result of a couple of hundred years of missionary work. And then the bamboo curtain came down and we heard nothing, we knew nothing. Christians we knew were being persecuted, some put to death, many in jail. It was assumed that Christianity would be wiped out under severe Mao Zedong brand of communism. But when the bamboo curtain came up after a number of decades, what a surprise we all got. In the year 2008 in Beijing University, a speaker from the Department of, Uni of Religious Affairs, he said, the government frankly does not really know with any degree of accuracy how many Christians there are now in China. We think it's about 130 million. And then in 2014, sociology professor Feng Yang estimated that if the current trends of growth of the Christian church in China continues, by the year 2030, there could be 247 million Christians in China. That's 19% of the population. That's more than the number of Christians in America, you see. While we have been focusing on the political, military, economic development of China and how much they've been in the news in these last few weeks in Australia, while that's been our focus, God has been at work raising up a church the like of which has never been seen in Christian history, a magnificent church. They have already accepted a goal of sending out 100,000 missionaries only around the world. A couple of years ago when uh, I was in a, a seminar, I was leading for a week in a certain city in that place where one is careful we don't exchange names or what we do or where we come from. But I got to know a couple of guys quite well. I said, uh, would you be prepared to tell me where you were at work? And they named the city. I said, how long have you been there? They said, 10 years. And uh, I said, well, you know, have you had any results? Because I knew that this province was a very tough province. They said, well, we are worker pastors. We can't work full time at being a pastor. They run a little business where they buy and sell things to maintain themselves. But yes, in the 10 years, we've been able to see a little success. Well, how many churches have you started? Well, we're not sure. Well, have a guess. How many do you think? And they had a little chat. They said, oh, we think in about the last 10 years, we've established 500 churches. 500 <laughs> How do you do that? Oh, that's easy, Pastor Stewart. It comes about through two pains. The pain of prayer, pr the pain in the knees through constant prayer and the pain of persecution. I said, well, <clears throat> I don't want to hear about that persecution thing. <laughs> Tell me about prayer. They said, well, in our churches, some ever since the beginning, 10 years ago, we've had continuous 24-7 prayer. Well, how does that look like? Well, a prayer team comes along and they pray for eight to 10 hours and then another team comes and takes over and takes over and so it rolls on, right? What else do you do about prayer? Well, every month in the churches, we have a special weekend where we 
give teaching further on prayer. Anything else? Oh, yes. Once a year, we go to a distant place up in the mountains where the government won't be aware of us, and we go there and we have a special prayer retreat. retreat. So I said, well, who gets to go there? Oh, well, the, you, you, you've got to qualify to go there. You can only go there if you have participated in the daily prayer life of your church for a minimum in the last 12 months of 300 days. I said, you know, down in Australia, we are not that prayerful. Um, what if I only was... In, involved in that for 299 days, could I come? And they said, oh, yes, yes, we, we, we'd make room for you, but the condition would be you'd have to sit outside the building. And this is a place where there's snow and ice for eight months of the year. We'd leave a window open so that you could hear what's happening inside. Wow, thank you for that. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42... It says there that those early disciples, they devoted themselves to prayer. That word devoted, it's like the instruments used in the tabernacle, in the temple, in the Old Testament. It means to be exclusively set aside for this holy purpose. And Paul picked up on that when he was writing to the church in Colossae, chapter 4, verse 2. He says, devote yourselves to prayer. And wherever that happens, amazing things happen. Because the church in China is a model which is being repeated around the world wherever I go, and I'm in many countries every year. And the same model, wherever I see the church growing exponentially, exploding in growth, there is always poverty and persecution and ceaseless prayer. The Chinese Christians, they regard it as a privilege to go to prison because they say it strengthens our faith. That's exactly what Jesus said it should be like because Jesus started to speak about persecution from the early times of his ministry to his apostles to prepare them for what was to come. And 11 of the apostles died violently. But when we read the Bible today, somehow we don't see that. We skip on to the other places more conducive to our personally blessed comfort zones, like how much God loves us. It's a truth. But there's a whole lot more in the Gospels, Jesus teaching on persecution, than there is on the love of God or prayer. It's amazing how it doesn't impact us. Because here in affluent Australia, we would rather not have our comfort zones too disturbed. And our affluence is toxic to spiritual well-being. But back in the Middle East, in Iraq, that's probably one of the places where the church in the world is growing fastest. It was Pastor Andrew White who went to the church of St. George in Baghdad in 1998. This is an Anglican church. And you have the mistaken belief that nothing could possibly happen in an Anglican church with a vicar in a funny collar. But Pastor Andrew, he even has MS, which is a, a pretty disastrous disease for which there is no cure. When he went there... In 1998, there were just six old men and a few women in the church. But by the year 2010, there were 4,000 worshippers, in spite of the many who had been forced to flee the country. When he moves around the city, he has an armoured car, which is given him by the government and 30 soldiers, because his life has often been under a threat and his church is attacked. In 2010, 13 Muslims came to him. And this is a common thing. I run across it again and again in all these conflicted areas. And their message basically was, we are sick and tired of Muslims killing Muslims. There has to be another way, a better way. Can you tell us what it is? It has to be with Jesus. And as they talked, these people said, well... We want to be baptized. We want to become followers of Jesus. 
Andrew rightly advised them of the potential outcomes because apostasy in Islam means automatic death. They accepted that. He baptized the 13. Within one week, 11 of them had been killed. By the year 2014, that's last year, the congregation had grown to 6,500. That's not counting the 7,000 who'd been forced to flee in the intervening time. How is this possible? These people, they talk of what it is like in in their situation. Firstly, they have continuous 24-7 prayer. They can't come to a church building to do that. It's too dangerous. So they organize their cells all around the city of Baghdad and one cell passes to the other to the other. 24-7 prayer. There's the start of why God is doing what he's doing. And then they report when they do are able to come together in their, their compound, in their facility there, it's a frequent thing that angels will turn up and they are there to enjoy the worship perhaps. And angels have brilliant light, even worse or better than these lights shining in my eyes, blinding me so that I can't see you nodding off to sleep. And they say, sometimes they've said to the angels, would you mind moving back a bit? You're interfering with our video here. It's causing overexposure. (laughs) If you want to know what it's like, go and read Ezekiel chapter 1, where it talks there, verses 15 to 21, about these strange wheels of light circling around. Oh, modern day commentators with our brilliant scholarship would all say, well, they probably had the wrong can of beans when Ezekiel wrote that and that he had some nightmare that's why but this is exactly where these guys are is where Ezekiel was in his day and these people see those same whirring lights around their compound and they say we can't explain it we just accept it we assume that this is some way in which God is protecting us because medical supplies and facilities are in such short supply because that whole capital city is under threat from ISIS, Islamic State, which is just about 40 kilometers away with their bloodthirsty onslaughts. Everyone that they pray for, they say, is healed. If God doesn't turn up, then they have no hope. The senior ladies of the church have a special ministry. Here's one to add to your multitasking abilities. They go and visit the sick in the hospital and especially the morgues where the bodies are and they report a number of times people have come back to life as a result of their prayers. These are the sorts of things that God is doing in this desperate, conflicted war zone of Iraq. And why not? You see, these people, they understand that unless God comes through, they have no hope. Many of these people have lost everything, but they still have a smile on their face. And when you ask, what have you got to smile about? They said, yes, it's true. We have lost everything, but we still have Jesus. That's why we can smile. Meanwhile, back here in Australia, Jesus said, It was harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than a camel to pass through the eye of a needle. Why? Because a rich person has no need of God. We can spit in his face. We can put in whatever laws we want to. We have no need of him until the big C comes, cancer or some other incurable disease. And then (laughs) there are very few atheists in the trenches when the bullets are flying. These are the tough places, persecution, poverty, and prayer. Next door in Iran. (laughs) In Iran, when Ayatollah Khomeini took over and deceived the country in 1979, he promised such freedom and renewal to get rid of the Shah of Persia. But when he got power, he introduced an Islamic revolution that he hadn't talked that much about. In Iran, at that time, it was estimated that there were about 500 believers who had been formerly Muslims. 
today with all of the pain and the suffering and the warfare in which Iran has been involved, the number of people from Islamic background long ago far exceeded the number of original Christians there. They are coming to the Lord in their thousands in Iran. But of course, uh, there is a little bit of a cost. I spoke to your associate pastor earlier in the service and warned him he's in a dangerous position because in Iran they say we appoint an associate pastor and he knows in that appointment he's to step up when the senior pastor is killed. Not if, but when. Maybe he's now going to resign from his associate pastorship. <laughs> One of the churches there said, it's been our privilege to offer three of our pastors as martyrs. But what a waste of a good life it would be not to live for Jesus and lose your life following him. God is doing amazing things in Iran, which I, of which I can't say more because this is being recorded. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 29, the ancient promise there is, if you seek the Lord your God, you will find him. If you look with him with all your heart and with all your soul, if you seek him, you will find him. If you look for him with all your heart and, for all, and all your soul, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. May I therefore ask you, for what are you really searching in this life? And what have you found? Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you for what you are doing in other countries in the midst of such violent, terrible warfare where our brothers and sisters are paying such a huge price for standing firm in you. And those who have escaped have done so with only their lives intact and little else. But they have proven, have demonstrated such a reality of you in their lives that is unknown almost here in our land. Father, we ask that you might Forgive us for the casual way in which we walk with you. We are somewhat self-centered, almost regarding you as we are conditioned to believe in a consumer God, where we rattle off our list of demands and expect like goodies from a slot machine, that they will quickly come popping out and we will be blessed. And if it doesn't happen how we want it, when we want it, then the evidence in our nation shows we walk away because our needs were not met in that way. Father, forgive us for the casual way in which we have related to you and one another. We pray that you might forgive those in leadership in our nation for daring to consider introducing laws which we know, according to your most ancient law, will be an abomination and bring curses upon us as a nation. Unless, O oh Lord, unless you turn the hearts 
of these women, these women and men who rule as a trust under you, turn them back toward you. And us too, Father, we pray that you'll be generous, merciful and forgiving toward us. We call out to you, Lord, have your way in our land, in our church and in our nation. And may Jesus Christ be thereby glorified. Amen.